in the 80s. There was a movie that showed me how to use my skills to defeat the forces of evil. Yeah, not that movie. That movie. It's Crossroads, the classic 1986 guitar-themed road movie where an average kid from Long Island squares off against the devil in a musical high-stakes poker game. In a decade of teen empowerment, when kids with technical, musical, athletic, and extraterrestrial superpowers rose to the occasion, Crossroads fit right in. Amazing, the Karate Kid had completely reconfigured his skills from martial arts to martials and axes. But we knew that this was really guitar legend Steve Vai, who played not only the infernal six-string nemesis Jack Butler, but also all of the now famous classically inspired guitar parts. Neoclassical guitar had seemingly appeared out of nowhere two years earlier with Yngwie Malmsteen's 1984 debut album, Rising Force. Ingve was already known in guitar circles as a member of Alcatraz and Steeler, and the hardcores knew him even earlier than that from Mike Varney's Spotlight column in the February 1983 issue of Guitar Player magazine. Meanwhile, Steve was cutting his teeth in the realms of the avant-garde as the little Italian virtuoso in Frank Zappa's band. But guitar evolution was moving so fast that before long, Steve was also playing in Alcatraz, deftly handling many of Ingve's neoclassical leads and expanding them with his own space-age take on two-handed virtuosity. By the time Crossroads hit theaters, the neoclassical style had gone from niche obscurity to silver screen glamour in under three years. And Steve was suddenly its most visible exponent. So for a lot of kids like me who were just entering our teens, Steve's incredible playing on the Crossroads TV commercial was actually our introduction to the style. Oh my God, the exotic sonics, the extreme accuracy, the emphasis on picking every note. It was the whole ethos of the neoclassical movement distilled into one lick. Eddie Van Halen had launched the guitar skills arms race in the late 70s, and it was immediately apparent that this was the next step in its evolution. Thousands of 80s kids heard Steve's impossibly precise picking, placed prominently at the apex of the trailer just before the title card with flux capacitor lightning bolts for extra effect. And we immediately knew that the key to defeating the Prince of Darkness was classical music, and more specifically, the diminished seventh arpeggio. The diminished seventh is a cornerstone of Yngwie's sound, and one of the most identifiable harmonies in the neoclassical lexicon. It's constructed entirely of minor thirds stacked on top of one another, which gives it a rootless feel that's perfect for inversion-style sequencing. This free-floating sound was utterly unique for modern rock, and the fact that it was arpeggio playing only made it even more mysterious, since it wasn't common knowledge yet how Yngwie was even doing all this. It goes as follows. Of course, nowadays, Yngwie's famous three-string sweep arpeggio shapes have become de rigueur in many styles of guitar playing. But the thing about the Crossroads diminished arpeggio lick is that it actually wasn't sweeping at all. It was alternate picking. Of course, Ralph is just miming the hand movements here, but it doesn't matter because we can tell just from the tone that this is not the Yngwie three-string solution the crossroads pattern really is moving across the strings. And this is an approach that, 30 years later, still packs a punch. It turns out that alternate picking is one of the simplest and fastest ways to play this pattern. The only problem is, most of the time, trying to reproduce Steve's wizardry isn't nearly as successful. All this jumping around is a thing we call string hopping and cracking the code. If you've ever tried to practice complicated picking patterns that move across the strings, then you're probably familiar with this feeling. Focusing on small movements won't fix this. That just makes the jumping movement smaller, but doesn't actually get rid of them. Metronome work isn't going to fix this either. 
because a thousand repetitions of jumpy movements is still just a thousand repetitions of jumpy movements. In fact, if anything, it's just going to help make them permanent. The real question is how do you make the jumping movements go away? And the first step is understanding that the Crossroads 4's pattern is really two licks in one. The first lick is a two-string lick with two notes on each string. Then the second lick is a three-string lick that goes one note, two notes, and then one note. Then you move down to the next group of strings and start again. Two and two. One, two, one. And so on. So let's divide and conquer. How do we solve the first pattern? Well, two note per string licks are pretty common. We see them all the time in pentatonic playing. And the alternate picking solution to this is something we talk a lot about in cracking the code. Let's say we're picking back and forth on one string. This means the point of the pick is down here in between the strings. If you play an upstroke, you're trapped between these two strings. And if you play a downstroke, you're trapped between these two strings. Either way, you're stuck. And this is why when you want to move to a new string, you feel the need to jump the pick like this. But now watch what happens if we simply slant the pick a little bit toward the floor. The downstrokes are still down here, stuck. But look what happens to the upstrokes. They all rise up out of the strings. What this means is that you no longer need the jumping movement to switch strings because every upstroke does this automatically. The power of this is really incredible. It means that whenever you play an upstroke, you can move to a new string with absolutely no penalty. In cracking the code, we call this type of pick orientation downward pick slanting. It is the solution used by Eric Johnson to play two note per string licks at high speed. And you can do this pretty much as fast as you can pick. Pick slanting allows you to use all your picking speed, whatever that happens to be, without slowing down for the string changes. In fact, it also allows you to use almost any kind of picking movement. For example, here I'm using a deviation-based picking motion. This is the side-to-side -side movement of the wrist. But you could also use a rotational forearm movement. elbow movement, you can even use shoulder movement. In the downward pick slanting world, the biomechanical source of the picking movement is not critical, only the path of that movement. As long as its travel is oriented so that the upstrokes clear the strings, you're good to go. So that's the first half of the lick. To solve the second half of the lick, we're gonna take everything I just told you and turn it upside down. Upward pick slanting. When you lean the pick upward like this, it's now the downstrokes that escape the strings and the upstrokes are stuck down here. But that's okay because in the second half of the lick, we're not gonna be switching strings after upstrokes at all. How easy is that? The downstrokes push away from the guitar and the pick effortlessly navigates the changes across three strings. Down on the single note, up down on the next string, and up on the single note. We normally think of one note per string sequences like this as challenging, but in this particular case, you can see that it's totally a non-issue. All we care about is that the pick is up here in the escape zone when we move from one string to another and it's the upward pick slant that gives that to us. Increasing the speed doesn't change that at all because the pick isn't hitting anything as it moves from one string to another. So now we've got the first half of the pattern and we have the second half. And really the only tricky thing here at all is connecting the two of them together. And this is where the single notes come in handy. Those are the pivot points. We start out with downward pick slanting and we play four notes. And now, as soon as we hit that fifth note, boom, we rotate to upward pick slanting. Now we just play the next two notes. And once again, as soon as we hit that single note, we switch right back to downward pick slanting. Here's the whole sequence. 
each half of the lick has a different pixel in it, and you just glue them together right at the halfway point on that pivot note. Then all you do is repeat the whole thing on the next group of strings. As you do this, the pick will effortlessly navigate all six string changes in this pattern, including those single notes. And you can take this all the way across the strings. Now I'm exaggerating these movements so that you can see them, but in faster playing, they become much smoother and flatter. You can see the gentle curvature of the pick slanting rotation. This is what makes this so natural. In fact, the amount of this is so slight that many players already do this without even realizing it. And by becoming more aware of this string switching power, you can start to do some really cool things. Of course, pentatonic, that's also two notes per string. Same exact picking pattern, same pick slanting pattern, only the fingering changes. The possibilities are really endless. But how does Steve do it? We don't actually see Steve play the fours lick in the movie. Ralph plays it. Of course, he's faking the hand movements, but some of the wide shots here look really pretty convincing. When I saw this as a kid, I wasn't entirely sure it was fake at first, and that was kind of intimidating. And what was also intimidating was this. We get some really nice picking hand close-ups of Steve in the Paganini section here, and right away you can see all this movement going on in his technique. This section of the solo is not a repeating pattern, so the string changes are more complicated, but just to take a representative example, here's a cool little one note per string sequence. This is a three string triadic roll, and Steve plays it starting on a downstroke, and we would expect to see upward pick slanting for that. The downstroke just sails right over the top of the next string, just as we'd expect thanks to the upward pick slant. Now, he's gonna hit the next note on an upstroke and rotate to downward pick slanting. And again, that's exactly what we see. Now the third note is a downstroke, so he's going to hit that note and roll right back to upward pick slanting. So he can hit the next note on an upstroke. And as soon as he does that, he's gotta go all the way to the high E string. So he's going to roll the downward pick slanting to do that, watch it happen. And this allows him to clear the strings so we can make that big diving movement to the top string. Now you'll notice that these pick slanting movements are probably being done through forearm rotation. If we rewind this and watch this again, look at this part of his arm right here. You'll notice how it periodically lifts off the body of the guitar. Now contrast this with the wide shot. The forearm movements are happening only intermittently and not on every note. At full speed, they just look like occasional twitches. That's how we know those are the pick slanting changes and not simply the alternate picking motion itself. And look at how interesting that picking motion is here. Look at all that thumb movement. In fact, if we go back to the close-up shot, we can see that on descending upstroke string changes, it's actually a lifting movement of the thumb rather than a change in pick slant that allows Steve to get over the string. Not only is this fairly unusual, but it's also unusual for Steve. Most of the time in Steve's high speed scale playing, we don't see any finger movement and we don't see any pick slanting forearm rotation either. The whole hand appears locked, and all the movement seems to come from wrist deviation. That's because this is a whole different technique. This looks like a pure downward pick slanting approach, where we switch strings mainly after upstrokes. By contrast, the crossroads technique, with all the complex finger and forearm movement, is Steve's two-way pick slanting technique, which he uses for more complicated, articulate patterns across the strings. And considering that Steve has said in interviews that he doesn't think he's all that great at pure alternate picking, I think we are allowed to be a little bit amazed at just how cool these movements are and how likely unconscious they are for him. The performance sequences in Crossroads are an incredible time capsule, offering us a glimpse back in history when Steve was the devil's henchman, both on the big screen and the little one. He was the badass sidekick with something to prove, and it really showed in both the laser-like precision and the fiery originality of his playing. So 
So when you launch into your diminished fours, you can summon up a little bit of that Jack Butler black magic, but just be careful when you head down to the crossroads at the corner of your block, because you never know who might be waiting for you. (laughs) 